The blue water wonderland of Port Stephens occasionally becomes a nightmare for a few mariners, particularly over the crowded Christmas holiday season. And when there is drama on the seas, often it's the Royal Volunteer Coastal Patrol that hears of it first. In that time we've had about 33 actual assists. Yet those emergencies make up only a fraction of the communication with the patrol. Between December 22nd and January the 14th, the service took 3,947 calls. The bulk of the calls are vessels going in and out of the port. They, they radio into us, let us know where they're going, how many is on board and what time they'll approximately be back. While a thousand calls a week means the 100 volunteers at the patrol have been kept busy, Tony Cotter believes it's been a relatively safe boating season. Generally the boating populace seem to be a lot more careful this year than they have been in the past. Maybe the message is getting through that the sea is dangerous and you've got to do it the uh, careful way. Scott Bevan, MBN News. For the past few years, the world has been anything but an oyster for growers in the Port Stephens area. Declining yields and rising costs have made times hard, and now the 70 growers have been refused permission on environmental grounds to burn used oyster steaks. This is an industry that certainly doesn't need a handicap such as that at this time. The growers say until the recent imposition of the ban, they've burnt off timber waste for decades. We've had no problems to date. That's just simply a technicality that we've come across where thou shalt not burn and uh, that's caused the problem. Under the clean air regulation burning in the open is prohibited except for approved purposes such as agriculture. The oyster growers are saying if it's good enough for the farmers to be exempt then they should be too so that growing piles like these can be eliminated. It's the only way really and the lesser of all evils to get rid of our rubbish cleanly. When I say clean I mean it creates the vermin problem down, the eyesore problem, uh, saves the fire hazard in the sense of timber stacked around everywhere. After considering alternative disposal methods, such as transporting the stakes to a garbage depot, a report to go before council tonight recommends approaching the Environment Protection Authority and seeking an exemption for the growers. We're simply going to ask the EPA that the oyster farmers be allowed to burn their stakes on site where they're accumulated. Scott Bevan, MBN News. This group of adults has found part-time work for the next six months. Today they were busy preparing their new base located at the Ties Hill Community Centre. In a joint project organised by Trees in Newcastle and Throsby Landcare, the group hopes to make the city a greener place. Special tree planting projects include work with Newcastle City Council, the Hunter Water Corporation and the landscaping of Throsby Creek. The participants are over the age of 21 and have been unemployed for the past year. Some already qualified in the field. We've got three people who've got university degrees, which, which is very surprising to me. I was very pleased when they came to the interview and they've spoken to me and explained that although they have uh, quite appropriate qualifications, their employers, employers say, oh, no, unless you've got experience, you can't get work. So this is the ideal opportunity for them. Under the Job Skills Scheme, the participants will work a 37 and a half hour week learning all aspects of horticulture. It's hoped this nursery based at Broadmeadow High School will turn into a sustainable business, selling trees and providing a valuable service. Coordinator Simon Scott says the doors will also be open to the general public. If people want trees planted out in their own house, yards or out the front on the nature strip, they can phone us and we'll uh, get, tell them what we've got available and we can send someone out to, um, to plant those trees if they're prepared to pay for it. Melinda Smith, MBN News.
Like many councils throughout the state, Lake Macquarie City Council has been re-evaluating the salary structure of its 750 full-time staff. Twelve months ago, council employed a Sydney consulting company to study each individual staff worker's performance and whether they were being paid a fair rate. People in uh, community areas especially, such as beach inspectors, childcare workers, library assistants, etc., weren't being paid relative to the skills required for the job. The study recommends 21% of council staff deserve more money. The salary increases range from $2,000 for a beach inspector who currently earns $24,000 annually to the town clerk whose $83,000 a year job is up for a boost of $18,000. How can Council justify a pay rise of $18,000, which for some ratepayers would represent three quarters of their annual income? All we can say is that the position was objectively evaluated using a market median. What we did was we had a look at a number of other councils within New South Wales and on a national, a national survey. And what we did was position Lake Macquarie City Council where we believed it should be in the market and then we paid approximately 90%. Mr Green says the pay rises won't mean money being taken out of areas like roadworks because Council has been setting money aside for the past few years to cover the increases. The bulk of the proposed pay rises were ratified by Council last night, with executive staff increases discussed behind closed doors tonight. All pay rises will go before Council for final approval next week. If given the green light, pay increases will be backdated to December 1st last year. Joseph Walker is truly an amazing 21-year-old. From Awaba, west of Newcastle, and in the city of Lake Macquarie, Joseph has continued his stunning career in swimming at both special and para-Olympic level. And capping off his rise to prominence, an unbelievable performance at the intellectually disabled section of the para-Olympics in Madrid, Spain during September. Joseph swam in nine events and captured nine gold medals setting world records in the 200 metre freestyle, the 4x50 metre relay and the 100 metre freestyle. Joseph has been lauded like a film star since his return and rightly so, and the people of northern New South Wales would like to add their congratulations to a young man of incredible ability. Swimming superstar, Joseph Walker. In 1797, Lieutenant John Shortland sailed into Newcastle Harbour, discovering the Hunter River and the area's precious coal supplies. With the 200th anniversary just four years away, ideas have already been suggested on how to commemorate the occasion. Newcastle City Council is calling for help from the general public to plan the celebrations. The ideas will be collated and given to Newcastle Council. We will look through all these submissions and we'll come up with all the ideas and agree with what, which, which way we think should go. There'll be several committees formed and people will work towards that and getting it all together, much the same as we did in the bicentennial year. Alderman Margaret Gumas says she anticipates the major events will centre on the foreshore. It's hoped the program will attract visitors to the city. I can imagine the regatta that we're going to have in four years' time. I think people will be coming, certainly from all over Australia, and I think any international visitors that we have will be able to draw them to Newcastle. 
Despite the four-year deadline, the pressure is on to ensure the bicentennial is a spectacular event. There's a lot to do, a lot to plan, a lot of uh, work to be done to let the people really want to be involved. It, it starts, it's, to start early, I think we're going to end up with a very good um, birthday party. Ideas can be submitted to Newcastle City Council until mid-February. Melinda Smith, NBN News. The Call Us First initiative will operate in police stations across the Northern District. It's designed to take care of smaller complaints against officers which can add up to hours of paperwork keeping police off the beat. We get complaints about sometimes the way our police talk to the public. Uh, some of the simple things where police with uh, sunglasses on, uh, it's hard to see their eyes. Commander for the Northern Region, Assistant Commissioner Russ Cook says most people believe they need to take their complaints to the Ombudsman, who then refers the matter back to police for investigation. A more personal and speedier approach to customer service is now encouraged. What we're seeking to do is try to get the people to go and personally see those patrol commanders and, uh, and if we can conciliate with them that would reduce the workload of our police in doing these type of inquiries. The new initiative is aimed at boosting the image of the police force, a problem the department says is already showing signs of improvement. We feel that uh, we've got rid of that uh, idea of police investigating police and they won't do anything about it. You can be rest assured uh, and the public can be rest assured that if they go and see their uh, patrol commanders that they will get attention and action will be taken on their behalf. Melinda Smith, NBN News. It took the strength of two cranes to lift the former 25-tonne passenger carriage carefully from the tracks. The delicate operation was helped by local companies donating their services. Six units were moved from their holding yard at Broadmeadow to begin another life a short distance away. They'll make a welcome addition to the Samaritans Foundation's Youth Resource Centre on Brunker Road at Adamstown. After a paint job, the carriages will be transformed into office space, housing an array of community services for young people, including medical and legal advice. Getting the project off and on the ground has been a joint community effort with thousands of dollars in volunteer labour and equipment. It's been uh, amazing actually to see all the different companies working so well together. Uh, it's worked out to be approximately $250,000 worth of um, support in kind. It's been great. Melinda Smith, NBN News. In August 1991, 12 people died when a hostel for mentally handicapped adults caught fire. John Pascoe and Neville Grieve were flown to the scene by rescue helicopter. They found many of the patients wandering lost and confused. When we arrived at the, at the hostel, there were um, a number of people, as we found out later, a lot of people who had wandered off into the bush. Uh, some of the others had wandered down to uh, a homestead about half a kilometre away. We based ourselves at that homestead. Uh, there was no communication from the homestead to the fire and there was no communication from the fire scene back to Newcastle. So we, having a telephone at the house, set up a, a communication link between the, the scene and uh, our base back here. Today those efforts were rewarded with certificates of appreciation.
also presented with awards officers Bruce Hounslow and Richard Brown. They and Musselbrook officer Ivan O'Breezer won the Australian ambulance titles and are now regarded as the best ambulance officers in the country. And it wasn't only ambulance officers in the limelight. Mrs Dulcie Huff of Broadmeadow joined the state's exclusive Heart Start Club. Last year, Mrs Huff suffered a heart attack and officers Peter Johansson and Wayne Garner saved her life by using a heart start machine. They've been marvellous, those men. I wouldn't have been here. I, the son didn't even know the number to ring and I said, just ring triple O. I didn't think I was going to last till they got there. Jodie McKay, NBN News. It's a rare occasion that Adam Murphy has a bottle of beer. You see, Adam and his wife Shirley have one of the state's largest collections of beer cans. The collection fills four rooms of their Whitebridge house, more than 10,000 cans in all. Adam specialises in the Aussie Ale, while Shirley keeps track of their foreign haul. Among the collection, this rare wildlife series of Simba beer from South Africa. And behind every can is a tale Adam's only too willing to tell. These cans of Tenants Lager from Scotland have outraged feminists. They go back to the 1950s, and a court case currently underway could spell the end of the series. Then there's this can of Cascade beer. It was released during a brewery strike in the early 80s. Unfortunately, the beer on the front is green. The oldest can in the collection is this Pilsner Lager can from Great Britain. It dates back to the 1940s and it was found in a shearing shed in outback Queensland. Most of the cans have been exchanged by mail with overseas collectors. And of course the question is, does Adam drink all the beer? I've drank a fair few of them. I haven't uh, drank all of them, but uh, in this hot climate of ours it's uh, definitely uh, quite a good hobby. Well, here's one for those serious beer drinkers. This Russian beer has an alcohol content of 13%. With most of the walls covered, Adam says he's yet to work out a way to mount his collection on the roof and he dreads the day we have another earthquake. During the earthquake, uh, virtually all the cans that you see here tumble to the floor and I believe from uh, my wife who was home at the time and the neighbours, the noise was absolutely tremendous of all these thousands of aluminium cans hitting the floor and bouncing around. And it took you a while to pick them up? About four days to put them all back on the shelves. Jody McKay, NBN News. Some of the internationals competing were getting a feel for the course today. They included the current New Zealand amateur champ Richard Lee, Maori player Jason Lang and former British amateur champ Gary Wollstoneholme. It's Gary's second appearance. Last year he shot a 63, the best round of the tournament. He hopes to repeat this performance, but having just come from 3 degrees Celsius temperatures, it may take some acclimatising. We've just come from obviously uh, cold, wet conditions and obviously the courses are very muddy. Um, this is going to be quite a culture shock for us. With 206 players competing, organisers say it's the highest standard field they've ever had. Leading the contingent is 21-year-old Philip Tatarangi. Philip is the current world number one amateur. Last year an extremely good one, with Philip winning the Australian foursomes, New South Wales stroke play and the New Zealand plate. So what's the secret to his form? I think patience is a lot of things. I mean, if you work hard enough and you're working on the right things, that uh, really, if you're just patient, things will start to fit into place. And Philip says he's considering turning pro at the end of next year. Play in the Lake Macquarie Championship begins on Saturday. Catherine Lamond, NBN News.
Grey skies and rough waters greeted the international fleet as competitors lined up for the start of seven days sailing. It was a picturesque scene, but the tranquility was soon blown away with the start of the first radial class heat. The laser class provides some of the fiercest racing on the water. With all boats exactly the same, the result depends purely on sailing skill and a bit of luck. Battling a 10 knot south to southeasterly wind, competitors were forced to make the most of their conditions. Belmont's Jacqueline Ellis took an early lead and went on to win the women's division in the radial heat. While in the open, New Zealander Dean Barker beat home three times world champ Glenn Burke. Racing continues tomorrow. It was the familiar formula for disaster. Light rain and a section of roadway with just a single lane in either direction. According to reports, about 7am, the northbound early model Toyota Land Cruiser, towing a trailer, clipped a guidepost and swerved a fatal few metres into the path of the southbound Bedford camper van. The Bedford slamming into the side of the Land Cruiser with brutal impact. Of the six occupants of the Land Cruiser, three were to die almost instantly. A girl aged about nine, a middle-aged man and an elderly female. In the van, two young men aged about 20 died. A 24-year-old man suffered serious chest and spinal injuries. Ambulance and rescue crews from Taree were assisted by passers-by as the roadside was turned into a casualty station. The most seriously injured survivor, a 14-year-old boy from the station wagon, being taken to the John Hunter Hospital in Newcastle by the Westpac rescue helicopter. Two other passengers in the Land Cruiser, a 72-year-old man with chest injuries and a 9-year-old girl with a broken arm and internal injuries, were taken by road to Taree. The elderly man later being airlifted to the John Hunter Hospital for surgery. He remains in a serious condition. The state coroner, Colin Glass, flew to the scene to take charge of inquiries into the cause of the crash. We're talking about a major thoroughfare, aren't we, in Australia, you know, serious accident and five have been killed. So I think it's an appropriate case for the state coroner to get involved in. Police have not released the names of those killed and injured, but the occupants of the Land Cruiser are believed to be family members. The Pacific Highway was closed until mid-afternoon as investigators began sifting through the details of the tragedy. Jim Sullivan, NBN News. It was the realisation of dreams that had brought Northern New South Wales top sports stars together. Fourteen finalists, including last year's winner, swimmer Chris Feidler, gathered for a ceremony to honour our greatest achiever. It was a parade of champions. Equestrians Vicky Roycroft, cyclist Scott Sunderland and sailing sensation Chris Nicholson, who, with brother Darren, claimed the World 505 Championships. Now, uh, your brother Darren at the moment doesn't mind you getting all the accolades? Um... I don't know, he might. <laughs> North Haven's Daphne Shaw represented the Bowls, while the Knights' Mark Sargent and Paul Harrigan represented Rugby League. On the sand, beach sprinter Veronica Lee excelled and Scott's Head's Nerida Falconer made waves in surfing. Other finalists included Tamworth hockey star Michael York, Newcastle tennis player Rachel McQuillan and massive bodybuilder Anthony Wingett. Martial arts Charlene Machen was recognised, along with athlete Sean Crichton, a man determined to make up for missing out on the Barcelona Games. Firmly in the back of your mind, Atlanta 1996. That's right, that's the big long-term goal now. Commonwealth Games? Commonwealth Games in 94, so that, that's the mid-range goal. There was also a special award for a special achiever, Lake Macquarie swimmer Joseph Walker. And then it was time for the major award. And the winner is Matthew Ryan. Matt is overseas. His award was collected by a proud and pouting brother Heath. A deserving winner of the award and one that was well and truly appreciated. It's moments like this that makes you think, oh golly, this is, this is worthwhile. So to St George and NBN, thanks very much.
A win was vital for the Breakers' playoff hopes and their intentions were clear. Sydney's goalkeeper was continually under pressure. The defence cracked in the 17th minute. Nicky Meredith's goal took the Breakers ahead 1-0. Just five minutes later it was 2-0 thanks to this sensational effort from Darren Stewart. Sydney tried desperately to fight back, but their fate was sealed through Rod Brown. Although Sydney dominated most of the play in the second half, they managed just one goal, Tony Kurzlevich scoring in the 58th minute. The win is the Breakers' second against Sydney this season and puts them on 21 Premiership points. It seemed like almost everyone in Taree converged on Victoria Street this morning to be either part of or watch the Aquatic Festival Parade. The street was a mass of colour and excitement as every vantage point was used. Newly crowned Queen of the Festival, 19-year-old Lisa Fleming from Taree was introduced to the crowd, followed by the 1993 charity princess Suzanne Schroeder. Paddle Pop Line was on hand to entertain the children, while a group of volleyballers played a travelling game. Some rode their way down the street, while others rocked and rolled. The aquatic festivities continue until Sunday night. The junior titles draw competitors from all regional branches except Newcastle and the Illawarra. It's a massive event with more than 2,000 youngsters converging on Park Beach for two days of competition. Conditions were perfect today as organisers ploughed through a heavy program of heats and semi-finals. The entrants are aged between 7 and 14 but they are just as determined as their older counterparts. Last year, the Woolgoolga Club took out first place on the overall point score. Midway through day one, the defending champs are equal second with Ballina behind host club Coffs Harbour. The action continues tomorrow morning with the March Pass leading the events from 9.30. It's a sound locals will have to get used to across the weekend. More than 80 high-powered speedboats will be disturbing the peace along the river, competitors travelling from interstate to take part in the two-day event. The buzz of the boats may be unpleasant to the ears, but it's out on the water where the real danger lies. Just one slip behind the wheel spells disaster. This driver was lucky to escape unharmed. The action continues tomorrow morning. The umbrella was a must in the golf bag as day one of the championships got off to a soggy start. But the conditions didn't dampen the play, the wet green still managing to favour many. The best of the morning rounds was shot by Eastlake's Glenn Cody who fired a 67. He's one shot ahead of New Zealander Philip Tatarangi while promising Englishman Gary Wollstonehome had a first up 71. The rain also didn't bother competitors at the New South Wales Country Water Polo titles at Lambton. More than 40 clubs will contest the titles, which finish on Monday. Glenn Burke has just about achieved everything in sailing. He's represented Australia at the Olympics, raced in the 1987 America's Cup campaign on board Kookaburra 3 and was the 1991 Ampole Yachtsman of the Year. 
but it was in the lasers that Burke made his name. A three-time world champion, the Sydney Sider is using the championships to reunite himself with the class that shot him to sailing stardom. Burke has spent just two weeks preparing for the titles, a far cry from Barcelona. I spent 18 months and, and hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to put together a good campaign for Barcelona. For this I've spent two weeks. But the opportunity to race against a world-class fleet was worth the rush. Well, I love the class. I enjoy sailing them. I enjoy the people. Regattas are a lot of fun and this is a huge regatta. It's probably the biggest one we've ever seen in Australia. Burke finished second on day one, the only full heat race since the titles began three days ago. If the council will allow 5% development on that particular property, the number of houses, let's, let's say 100, could be, uh, could be built there and the uh, profit from that particular development would pay for the estate. Although not willing to release all the details, Ivan Welsh says his proposal offers an alternative solution to the controversial future of the Greenpoint estate. Mr Welsh says existing owner DF McCloy is interested in an $8 million sale, but it's Lake Macquarie Council's support that's needed for the plan to proceed. He says he wants to raise concern over conflicting reports regarding Council's ability to purchase the land. Well, I've seen memos be from the uh, financial manager there who says that they can't afford it. In simple terms, if they go down that track, they will lose uh, services and people will lose jobs. That's his quote. Lake Mayor Alderman Doug Carley was unavailable for comment on the matter. A statement issued by the council late this afternoon said all suggestions of offers to help bring Greenpoint into public ownership were welcomed, but there had been no formal representation made by Mr Welsh. Mr Welsh says his idea was raised by an alderman at last week's council meeting. The proposal goes before council tonight. Melinda Smith, NBN News. At Spears Point Park, where the majority of Lake Macquarie's activities will centre, council staff were busy with last-minute preparations to ensure a big crowd will enjoy the planned events. The action starts at 9am with a family fun fair. There'll also be a street procession, a naturalisation ceremony and official Australia Day functions led by Bob Hawke. Later in the evening, there'll be a concert followed by a fireworks display at 9 o'clock. In Newcastle, workers were also busy setting up. Like last year, activities will focus around the foreshore and crowds of up to 10,000 are expected. The beach breakfast on Nobby's Beach is sure to be a lot of fun and that's followed by the Australia Day ceremony here at the Carriage Shed. At that ceremony, our Australia Day ambassador and guest of honour, Phil Kearns, who is the Australian Rugby Union captain. As well, there will be ethnic dancing and band recitals, plus a march through city streets by our Aboriginal community to mark Australia Day and locally launch the Year of the Indigenous People. Newcastle's festivities will culminate with a service at Christchurch Cathedral. With Australia Day preparations in full swing, it's estimated up to 50,000 Hunter and Central Coast workers have taken advantage of tomorrow being a public holiday and used today as a flexi or rostered day off to effectively give them a four-day weekend. Catherine Lamond, NBN News. While an accurate picture is still sketchy, the circulation of fake $100 bills like this may run into tens of thousands. Similar notes have been detected in locations ranging from a Sydney RSL club, a Central Coast racetrack, a Coffs Harbour service club and more recently Newcastle night spots. Believed to be the product of a high-tech photocopier, the crowded locations have allowed the culprit to pass the counterfeit money undetected. On Sunday night, a man described in his 30s was successful in using six fake bills in the Tattersalls Club, the Great Northern Hotel and the Queen's Wharf Brewery. 
The offender is described as around 185 centimetres tall, aged in his 30s with blonde shoulder length hair tied back in a ponytail. The counterfeit bills have been handed over to the currency unit of the Federal Police. Local detectives expect strong leads will help track down the culprit within the next few days. Melinda Smith, NBN News.